Good afternoon. I would like to call the Hillsborough County Emergency Policy Group meeting to order. Will the clerk, will the clerk please call the roll? Miller? Here. Overman? Here. Merman? Here. Cronister? Here. Castor? Here. Ross? Here. Lot? Lot? Snively? Here. And Ms. Wise? Here. Thank you. You have a quorum. Thank you very much. We'll now move into public comment. The emergency policy group welcomes comments from citizens about any issue or concern. Your opinion is valued in terms of providing input to the EPG members. However, it is requested at the same time when you address the EPG that comments are not directed personally against an EPG member, a staff member, or a presenter, but rather directed at the issue. This provides a mutual respect between the EPG members and the public. 20 members have been set aside for each speaker, and each speaker will have two minutes. Uh, we only have one speaker that is signed in this, this afternoon. Uh, that is Ms. Brown. Ms. Brown, you recognize. I just wanted to personally thank you for mandating the mask order and working hard to keep me and my family safe and taking the virus seriously. Thank you very much. Thank you, ma'am. We appreciate that. Thank you. Um, I don't think we have anyone else signed up to speak. Am I right? That is correct, sir. That concludes public comment. Well, thank you, Mr. Brewer. Uh, we now move into emergency management update. Mr. Tim Dudley. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, sir. We continue to move forward with testing. Total testing to date, 71,760. Appointments scheduled this week, 9,921. Also starting this week, Hillsborough will dramatically increase the number of appointments for residents at the three county COVID-19 testing site at our community centers. Expanding hours and offering uh, weekend availability. The capacity at the Lee Davis, Plant City, South Shore testing sites will increase from about 2,700 total tests per week to 9,000 available tests per week. The testing expansion is made possible over the next two weeks due to the transition of healthcare partners at the three sites to contract and support being temporarily provided through the Florida Division of Emergency Management. The three community testing sites will be extending hours for scheduled appointments three days a week and will be setting aside two days a week specifically for targeted mass testing for first responder, healthcare, and other critical industries. For the next two weeks, test sites at Lee Davis and Plant City will continue testing for residents with expanded appointment and hours on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays. Test sites at the South Shore Community Resource Center in Ruskin is changing operating days for residents to Wednesdays, Thursdays, and Saturdays in order to offer more weekend testing capacity. All sites will have new hours of operations from 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. And appointments are available now. Logistics, we have 43 guests checked into the isolation site. And we will continue to adjust testing capacity in response to increased testing demand and as PPE supplies and staffing permits. This concludes my update. Any questions? Thank you, Mr. Dudley. Uh, and I see no questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, sir. Public health, you're welcome. Public health update, Dr. Holt. Uh, yes, sir. This is Dr. Holt, uh, Florida Health, uh, Florida Department of Health, Hillsborough County. Uh, today, we'll again present the latest epidemiologic and hospital data. Uh, I will provide the overview and take homes, and then Mr. Wagner will review the um, graphs and then look at the dashboard. Um, next, we will have Dr. Curran. Um, Dr. Curran is the chairman of the Hillsborough County Healthcare Advisory Board, and he's also a professor of emeritus at USF, and he will talk about uh, 
potential, they're looking at the potential for COVID surge in children. And then lastly, we will provide a Gina Early, Director of the Healthcare Services, going to talk about testing sites. Um, so let me begin. Um, Kevin, if you could put up the first slide or number two. Go ahead, sir. Okay. Um, we'll begin with our total numbers. Um, we've added 544 since this was presented, so we have 20, uh, 25,437 total cases. Uh, there will always each week there will be an increase, but as you can see, the uh, magnitude of the size of this increase has continued to decrease. So that is good news. Um, looked at this, looked at this number another way. Uh, the total percent of our population that has been tested or confirmed uh, to be infected uh, was is now 1.8. Someone please mute their microphone. Go ahead, Mr. Dr. Hart. And uh, this um, will report 264 deaths, although as of this morning, it was 278, but using the 264, uh, the total percent of our population that has died of COVID is 0.018%. Um, the number that have uh, recovered is now an increase from uh, 1,200 from um, Monday's report is now 5,626. Looking at the trajectories, uh, what's going on with the number of infections and in our testing, uh, the 14-day average uh, now is 627. It was 670 on Monday. Again, represents a 7.7% decrease. Um, if you look at the seven days, which, which uh, Mr. Wagner will show, uh, we looked very even better. That's a 554 um, daily average or a 20% over the last seven days. I do want to be cautious, and these numbers still remain very high. And ideally, we'd like to get back towards where we were uh, in May, which was around 50 cases a day. The testing uh, is continues to be a success story. Um, we are now doing uh, almost twice the number that uh, we uh, targeted when we began the mitigation phase of 2,250. Our, our goal will now be to increase this further so we can reach closer to around 6,000 done on average a day. Um, that will allow us to get into the containment and the suppressive phase with uh, the rapid return of these results as they come in. And as Mr. Dudley described, I'm confident and very appreciative in all the work that's being done in this area. The Looking at our daily positivity rate, 14 days, 15.04%. Um, this number uh, it also continues to, to decrease, although again, we are well above what we would like to do at least a 10%, and my preference would be in the vicinity of 5%. Um, so in summary, we continue to have an active amount of community-based transmission, but the decreasing numbers, average of cases per day, and the positivity rate is encouraging. Once again, we must not relax, keep up our social distancing and mask use. Let's look at hospitalization data. Uh, I would like to remind and um, clarify that uh, there are two sources of this data. There's the ACA data that the hospitals are required to report to daily. And then there's gov for more information about all of our programs and services. And well, then there is the. Uh, Excuse me, Dr. Hope. Well, everyone, please mute yourself. Everyone, please mute yourself, except Dr. Hope and Mr. Wagner. The, uh, you, Dr. The other, thank you, sir. The other source is the provided um, by Tampa General, or actually, which is a collaborative of the hospitals, Dr. Chang, uh, and that's the data that the EPG has chosen that we will report. Uh, I will re 
repeats his disclaimer again. His data does have is delayed um, several days and incomplete. This all not hospitals uh, do report into that system. Um, I will take a moment to describe the ACA data that we report or is reported and that I look at. Um, the percent occupancy is based on license bed. Um, the license beds are the total number that have been approved for each facility. The number that is critical is the number of staffed or actual beds that the hospitals are able to surge and increase to uh, approach the number of beds they're li licensed for. Um, so the percent of occupancy on the license will also be a little less um, than they're able to do from their staffing. And this is why uh, the hospitals and also our long-term care have been asking for support with staff, which the state has provided in the forms of nurses and physicians. Um, the other point I would like to make that's, that's been questioned in the ACA data is that patients are reported if they are admitted with the primary diagnosis of COVID. Um, what that means is that that's why they were admitted. Um, there's also a second category, which includes those that are admitted perhaps for, for something else, but were tested and found to be COVID positive. Um, if you're in a car wreck or something, you break your leg, they find out you're positive. That's not why you were admitted, but you were found to be COVID positive. The information I look at is that total number, and that's just because caring for a COVID positive patient requires the extra demands on the hospital, specifically specific beds and additional PPE. So with that said, we'll look at the hospitalizations as uh, reported by the Tampa Journal, and I'll make reference to the ACA. The seven-day rolling average census uh, uh, is reported in 495, which is a 20% decrease. Um, using the ACA data, that would be a number of 587. The bed occupancy is reported at 66%. Um, that's really unchanged from the from the previous seven days. Uh, ACA is a bit higher at 76%, but again, this is on the licensed bed, not the staff beds. ICU occup occupancy is nearly 82%. That's a 2% decrease from the previous seven days with our temperature journal data. This is very close to the ACA data of 85% because really there's not much difference. The hospitals generally are fully staffed or close to staffed for their ICU beds. The, the next one is the seven-day average uh, admissions um, are reported through Dr. Tang and the Kemp General uh, Hospital Collaborative is 53, and that's a 39% increase from the previous seven days. Uh, for ACA, today's was 68, and their average is 64. Um, again, as I mentioned, you know, my subset of this admissions are from long-term care, and that's continued to creep up, uh, averaging 14 per day over the last uh, seven days. Um, University Village is running a census of 70, and the state is also bringing um, availability of a dedicated SNF to our region or our county, which uh, will open in the next week or so. Good news. Lastly, I'll look at our deaths based on the 264 as reported in here. That's a seven day rate of 4.4%. Um, and actually does represent a decrease from the seven day period. Um, this is a challenging report only because of the data uh, that, apologize, the um, data that is presented um, through the medical examiner or the Department of Health, which we've chosen the Department of Health. Uh, with that said, I will now turn it over to Mr. Wagner. Thank you, uh, members of the EPG, Kevin Wagner, business analyst for the Healthcare Services Department. I will present to you the updated dashboard for Hillsborough County. Under Ms. Wise's leadership, staff was able to 
uh, move an internal finish and move an internal dashboard out to the public facing website indicated below that replaced the previous one that was uh, shown on my reports. At a high level um, concept, because we have such a, an engaged community and partners, we made this try to be very easy to understand. The light green may be trending in the correct positive direction and anything at the red level trending in the unfortunate direction of whatever that category is. With, all due res with respect to the benchmark summary, again, was 24,891 on the top row. The deaths were 264. As Dr. Holt indicated, these numbers have changed a little bit with today's report. This benchmark dashboard will update every 12 hours. Um, so again, probably this afternoon, it would reflect the current numbers. Um, the case data is represented in row two, the case and testing data. So the testing seven day percent change of cases has decreased by 21%. Again, the update, the 14 day case percent change has decreased a little under 5%. And then we have our testing data, which is updated weekly. The last row on the benchmark landing page is the hospitalization data. Primarily as discussed by Dr. Holt, it is re related to the TGH data source, not the ACA. Uh, but again, we're looking at the occupancy of the um, available beds, not the licensed beds for occupancy and ICU occupancy. So take that into consideration with regard to the overall look at hospitalization data. The next page of the, of the dashboard is something that you've essentially seen before. It is representing the cases by gender, which still makes up the 52, 46, 47% for male to female ratio, female to male. Your cases by age group in row one on an aggregate with a date range slider. So on the public facing website, you are able to slide the information back and forth up to the current date. The cases by summary, we are looking on the second row. This is trending flat as indicated, slightly downward the last three days. Uh, today's data was a little bit higher. So again, I don't wanna say downward, but more of a flattening. Um, again, the seven day average was around 554. The 14 day average was 627. The testing summary data, which is updated generally weekly, shows the overall testing file. That's information for Hillsborough County. Um, to date, roughly 15% of, of the population based upon the testing file has been completed of the, for Hillsborough County. A vast majority, again, are, you know, have been con confirmed or not positive. Only about 1.8% have received positive of our total population. And the testing is again 31,000 over the week. And this is a file that will be updated weekly for record purposes. The hospitalization page landing, again, it, re repeating what Dr. Holt saying, this source is the TGH data source. Top row, the middle box is the individuals presented with um, COVID like illness in the emergency department by week. The week of July 12th through July 19th was a, a better week with regard to that data represented, um, coming down from the previous week. So again, presenting at the ED is a little different based upon the data source. The hospitalizations by age group, again, is still trending above the above 50 to 60 to 70 year olds as identified in the FDOH report for hospitalizations. The census and admissions are the TGH, again, trending upward with the last day I to try not to look at because of the, the turnaround time for Dr. Chang's data exchange. Um, but again, 495 was the census on the hospitalizations while the hospital admissions were 53. Again, that's trending in the direction that we're wanting to and, and or flattening. And that's all stop there. Okay, thank you, Mr. Wagner. And I see no questions. So thank you, uh, Dr. Houghton. Thank you, Dr. Um, uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Commissioner Oval, when you recognize. 
Can I just get a clarification on what uh, Dr. Holt had stated? On slide three, I think I heard him say that the first bullet said the seven day rolling average census COVID hospitalized was 495. This is a 20% increase from the previous day. And I thought I heard him say decrease. Am I, is the slide right or, or was, or is Dr. Holt's statement correct? I'm trying to get clarification on that particular item, please. I, if I did misspeak, misspeak this, Dr. Holt, if I did, I apologize. Uh, it is a 20% increase from the previous seven days. Okay. Tonight. I may have heard it wrong. I just thought I heard decrease. I was like, well, it says increase. So I just wanted to make sure I was clear. Thank you very much for the clarification. Appreciate it. Commissioner Merman, you recognize. <laughs> Commissioner Murphy, you got to take yourself off mute. I'm forgetting. Um, okay, so the the graphs and everything is that based on the consortium local consortium data or the ACA data? The hospitalizations is on the local consortium data. Okay, and the rely. At, okay, so the difference, like. Um, Dr. Holt, you described this, the difference between ACA and the um, hospital data, um, it would, how would that affect the reliability of the data? Uh, yes, ma'am, uh, this is Dr. Holt. Uh, reliability is, it's, they're both, I guess, reliable in the sense that, but Dr. Chang has repeatedly said that his will not match ACA um, both again, because he doesn't have all of the hospitals reporting it, so it's ACA does report all hospitals. Okay. And Mr. Wagner, Mr. Wagner mentioned that, uh, you know, there's a day or two, so you, you sort of have to look back a couple of days for him to get his seven day average. It's not, um, the DACA date is about 24 behind. Um, Dr. Chang's will be a little farther. And I point this out. Okay. As much because as dashboards, if you look at other counties, you'll see their percent of occupancy will be look appear to be significantly higher and, and make it sound like we're having, you know, uh, it's just it's just a clarification. I just it's important that people understand the data source. And that's why I emphasize that. Uh, I'll stop. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay, Dr. Holt, Mr. Wagner, thank you very much. We now move on to the task force for any potential COVID surge in children. Dr. Uh, Dr. Curran. I'm unmuting. Can you hear me now? Yes, sir. Good Let me afternoon. See if I can share content. Uh, I've not done this before. Mr. Wagner, can you help me since you have the children's presentation? Sure, I'll just share it on mine, sir. Thank you. You're more proficient at it than I. And I'll be. We'll take just a moment to get that loaded. Thank you. It's certainly a privilege and an honor for me to address the EPG, particularly in my role as having been a pediatrician in this community for over 45 years and one of the founding faculty of the College of Medicine. I chair the hospital. Healthcare Advisory Board for Hillsborough County. I've done that for a number of years, but today I'd like to focus just a little bit on a different look, which is looking at the children. And in particular, I think that it is very relevant as we approach school opening. I've had the opportunity to review the full school documentation, and I congratulate them on a very, very, very comprehensive job that they have done. And in particular, we need to recognize that they are, in essence, a part-time city within the county of a very substantial size. And so I'm going to take a look just a little bit differently and a prob probably a little bit differently than those who've been before me. Uh, but I think we come out at the same point, and I will introduce some data that we just finished yesterday as well. So we'll start off with my slide on number two, 
which is a stacked bar graph for three 10 day periods of time, starting on 620 and ending 719. So they're the last month. For those of you who are very visually oriented, the very top thin slice is the smallest children, zero to four. And the age progresses as you go down with the bottom slice being those who are over 65 years of age. Those who are visual can see that the top slice doesn't change much. The bottom slice is increasing. And the middle slice, that great big blue in which are the adults 25 to 64, is increasing. At the same time, the gray and light blue have decreased somewhat. And they are the younger individuals. And we've adapted three measures, those who are preschool, zero to four, those who are school age, five to 19, and our young adults, which we will call 20 to 24, these are different age cohorts than are reported in the Department of Health uh, dashboard website, but the data is derived from the actual numbers reported on each of those days summed for the 10 days. So the conclusion of this slide for those of you who, well, there are two that I'm going to give you. If you go to the bottom of the average and you add zero to four and five to 19, that's roughly 12 and a half percent on the average, that the 20 to 24 per year old college student population, although we recognize many are working, but that's the traditional college age, is another 12.5. And that if you combine the adults 25 to 65 plus, you've got 75. So we have young people who make up about 25% of the population, somewhat older persons who then are 75% of the population, and the school is about 12.5% or one in eight of the population are students in the Hillsborough County School District. The good news is if you see and look at those three stacked bars, you will see if you progress from your the left as you view the screen to the right, the sum of the numbers has decreased. That's good news. We may have the next slide, please. Now we're changing from that to a rate per 100,000 10 day positivity by the common age groups. And I want to address this just a little bit differently. This is a rate. This is adjusted for the magnitude of the population. For instance, that zero to four group is about 96,000 individuals. And it Progress, progresses and we have used the most recent predictive census derived data for the age of the student. We know the actual ages, but we then will have grouped them before I finish today into separate parts that you know well, elementary and middle and high school ages reported as breakouts from the way you have classically seen the information. This slide sort of shows you what you just saw in the previous, which is that we have gone from a very large mid-segment, the 20 to 24, to a diminishing mid-segment. We have made progress there, but by implication then, the magnitude of others have shifted in the proportion of the total bar. Remember what was discussed last week in the EPG, that this is not a directed nor truly a random sample who get tested. They are individuals who are, for one part, symptomatic. Another part are worried that maybe they're getting sick. And another part that are worried and want to make sure that they're well on that day. And we don't have any information to differentiate between them. So we see that the average rate of positivity per 100,000 
for the period of 620 to 719, that's only two of the 10-day ep epochs that we talked about, range from a low of 155 to a high of 872 to a low to the other end, the elders, the inverse of the children, the elders at 282. So our hot is in the middle, but it is diminishing as the message as we go to the next. Next slide, please. Now, here is a third way to think, and this takes uh, some uh, reverse thinking. In this case, a higher number is better, not worse. The first two slides, high numbers were worse. And this says that in the population that we have in Hillsborough County, we look at the top left, the 710.89, it says one in 710 persons who are zero to four years of age has a positive test on these three epochs that are listed in the data table below. And that you see that the bottom one is we started with our seniors, uh, 65 plus, at 5.30, went to 1 and 2.59, if you go the brown at the bottom. So actually, there is more in our community in that age group as adjusted for their population. I don't think this is rocket science. We've all heard that kids don't have as much as the elders do, and that our long-term care population is exceptionally vulnerable. But we give you all the data here, and you're looking at the most recent month, and it says uh, we didn't have much in the kids at first, but we have grown in the kids because the numbers are not as high as they were. Now, if I haven't lost you, we're going to keep on going. Next slide, please. Now, here's the big picture. Worth taking your time, the classic DOH nomenclature, which is by age in 10-year epochs, except for the first zero to four years. And we have the case rows, all cases, that since approximately March the 2nd, there were 24,432 cases listed as of the date of construction of this table on July the 20th. And no great surprises in there. The hot spot was 25 to 34 years with 22% of the sample COVID year 20 to date in Hillsborough County. Then we have the new cases on a certain single day, July the 20th. And actually what you do see is while the 25 to 34 are the largest single segment, that there are some shifts in the numbers and that it's increasing at the bottom end, but the numbers are small when you look at a single day and it can fluctuate substantially, but it is similar to the all cases COVID year to date. The hospitalizations clearly skewed downwards to the elderly. The deaths are really from 55 onward with a with two reported in the 35 to 45 year age range so our problems are in the young and the old and we're seeing shifts in the middle next slide please Now, this is a slide. It's not nearly as sophisticated, which means that I probably did it. Not I probably. I did it on my own PC using Excel. But I thought it would show us something that would help guide us in making decisions in our community in the future. Plus, I'm going to give a little reference to the hot news that's been in the press from Korea, which had a very different strategy of tracking cases and clusters, et cetera, and we'll talk a little bit about it. What I think you see, this we start on the left-hand side on March the 2nd in 10-day epochs, all the way through July the 19th 
on the right hand side, what you clearly see, and I have been particularly, this is focused on preschool, elementary, middle school, high school, and I call them young adults because they're not all in college, but we are a university town. And so it has some lessons for us probably, or shall we say monitoring needs as we move forward in August and September. But what hits you right in the face is all of the lines are together until approximately 5.31 to 6.09. Now, I suspect if I were in a university class, I'd say, well, what happened in that period of time? And somebody would remember that's when we started to reopen. I think I remember the date with either June the 5th or 6th. And you see what has happened. We have all groups have increased. Notice on the left-hand side, the magnitude. This goes from zero to a thousand cases per 10-day period. Infections adjusted per 100,000 residents in that specific cohort with the cohorts redesigned to fit the ages of each of those groups and to break apart the cohort from uh, 15 to 24, which overlaps the school and getting out of school and maybe going to college or maybe going to work. And what you see is clearly the heavy blue line that goes and shoots from the sky and hits over 900 is the group which we would call young adults from ages 19 to 24 years of age. I used 18 as high school cutoff. I know that's not always true, but I think it's the bulk of the young people that are in school. And you can see the good news is the line is coming down in the last, uh, in this month, we're, we're bringing it down and while folks will like to attribute it to some of the things done in this community, and I would like to do that too, too, I'm not going to go there. I'm going to let you attribute it to the wonderful work the EPG in this community are doing in trying to make a difference. But my concern is the lower part of the curve. I think you will see the yellow is the high school. It went up. You are not going to be surprised. You would not have seen this in DOH data. And it's starting to curve down like that big, heavy blue line up above. And then the others also went up. And they went up a lot if you look at the magnitude of the cases. And so this is going to have to be part of the considerations going forward of monitoring of how we uh, recognize this is a dynamic situation, and I hope it is of value to our colleagues in the educational system because they are very important players in working with our young and children and our young adults in this community. So I'm going to let you think about that, but I want you to remember that it is not flat. It's not back to where it used to be in the school age children that are here and help that to guide decisions in this community. Next slide, please. Summarize the big picture. Age group that had the largest impact appears to be the 20 to 24 college group in evaluating the rate for 100,000 and the one to population figures, which was the XX in quotes. The 5 to 19 school age group contributes approximately 10% of the positive cases that occur in Hillsborough County within the last 30 days. There is hospital occupancy for ICU pediatric beds that is moderate, but it's not at a panic or surge level at this moment in time, but will need to be watched carefully and hopefully can be supervised by appropriate individuals designated uh, by our county. And the state hospitalization report indicates that a majority of COVID-19 hospitalizations occur over the age 
of 25 years of age. Now, I promised I'd mention the Korean paper. Uh, it won't actually be in official print until October. That's how long it takes journals to put things together. But this was deemed to be of importance and was published in an infectious disease journal uh, just this week. And um, the methods for contact tracing in the Republic of South Korea would not be acceptable to the majority of our population. They are very, very thorough. Uh, they are, use tracking, tracing, cluster identification, cell phones, and other things. And they moved really in about 24 hours of identification of the positive case to identifying the family or the cluster and tracking. They were unable to track whether it came from the adults, the older young people, to the younger, or the younger to the older, which happens in influenza. And one of the major reasons why we have influenza vaccination of children is to protect our seniors uh, by having herd immunity in our community. We're not able to talk about that with this organism, this virus. So um, we, what they found is that the zero to 10 year old were very low transmission. I got it at a very low percent, if I recall, at the two to 3% rate. But they found the 10 to 19 year olds were no different than the next group over them, the 20 to 30 year old group, in terms of contributing to infection in the family. So I think it fits some of the literature in medicine, not generally out in the open, about the difference in the receptors in the very young child, there are fewer of them, least known in nasal respiratory mucosa from a study in New York City, and that they probably do not get it at the same adherence rate that the older ones do. It's a development at developmental attribute of respiratory epithelium and the ACE2 receptor. So we have clearly got community transmission. We'd like to suspect that it may be coming from young adults in the household, or it may be becoming from young adults who are the parents of the children in the household. The Korean data says it's probably not from the young children to the household. And that's where we are. And this is a very dynamic process. It's recognized by most everyone. It's well documented in the school district's plan that it's dynamic. They have to be ready to make adapt to changes as things are identified. But I wanted to at least alert our community that children must be considered. They're not going to be large hospital consumers, large ICU consumers. There's a little of it. And yes, we have had this strange immune mediated musculoskeletal disease in our community, but a limited number of cases. I only know of two, one of whom did require a ventilator, but has recovered nicely. So given that, we have to keep our eyes and ears open in our plans for if there is transmission in our high school and middle schools that we are able to make the appropriate adaptive steps to it. And a lot of the planning has done to try and decrease the population at risk to achieve social distancing, to make sure there is hand washing and uh, they're carrying out the general, general plan, including the use of facial coverings. I let, I'll finally close with saying the American Academy of Pediatrics last week surveyed states nationally to see what were the trends that they were carrying out of the CDC recommendations in their state health plans, and almost all of them have plans. Florida did not have an official plan at the time of review. Thanks, I'm done, and I think I will stop now to use Dr. Holt's usual 
commentary. Uh, I've said enough, but I'm available for questions. Dr. Curran, thank you for your very in-depth and insightful uh, presentation. We really appreciate it very much. We do have some questions. Commissioner Merman, you recognized for a question. Unmute yourself. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Curran. Really appreciate the information. And um, I think this will give us a good baseline going forward. Is that is this information, will it be acceptable enough to use as a baseline going forward, say after the schools open, that we can track um, you know, what happens with kids and the infection rate and all that, the positivity? I'm going to try and respond this way. This is a collaboration and uh, I, I believe the data is available and is downloadable from Department of Health sites. Kevin is a whiz at doing it. And I think Dr. Holt should comment about there are a few disclaimers of the accuracy of the data. Remember that the data is posted as of the date the result is received not necessarily the data which the sample was taken from the patient and there can be as much as a 10-day lag in between so the 10-day epoch is a best attempt on the average to capture that dr holt probably ought to answer better than i dr holt sorry hello unmuting um, the, the, there was a couple of questions in here, I think. Uh, the first was using the data or repeating the data and looking at it over time. Uh, and that's certainly, we have that ability and, and I like to look at data so I can work, as long as I'm working with Kevin, we can continue to access that data. Um, okay. The other point, which I think is very critical that Dr. Curran brought up was the time delay between the um, requesting, testing, getting the results back, the turnaround time. Again, Mr. Dudley has um, indicated that uh, with all of his efforts, we're gonna sh believe we can shorten that significantly. The major problem will become, are the late labs able to handle how much we're giving them? Um, and what we use for investigations is when the onset of symptoms, which can be even further um, before the actual testing. So uh, all of this will be combined as we enter this critical phase uh, of reopening the schools. And I'll stop there. Right. Thank you all very much. Appreciate the information. Commissioner Overman for a question. Thank you, and thank you, Dr. Curran, for, for your presentation. That was really very helpful. Um, in your slide, um, regarding the rate of per 100,000 positivity rate, you can see the trend where young the college age kids dropped, um, but the age over 65 increased by a pretty healthy margin. Dr. Holt has previously said that family member transmission plays a big role in community spread. Um, and disease can spread quickly. Um, I'm concerned at our levels, not only for our younger kids, but our higher kids. So uh, my question would be, given that family spread is a, is a challenge and seems to be the, the method of transmission more common than not, um, how would you recommend maintaining and containing the risk of community spread that either is facilitated in schools or as we open brick and mortar schools, and whether it be, you know, elementary colleges, universities, as such. Uh, I'm not sure I'm fully competent other than that I'm a senior citizen to address at least one side of that. Uh, that is, um, I I'm going to speak pretty much from the heart when I say this, uh, being older, the elder, the older population have grandchildren. Grandchildren are undergoing acute withdrawal from their grandparents, and grandparents are probably not playing it as safe as they need to 
in contact with the younger and it's staying secure at home and virtually visiting not sitting on the patio with them in the back by the pool or watching them in the pool, et cetera. So I think we need to have messaging to our seniors about we need to stay the distance and we have to deny ourselves that pleasure unless we do it by an alternate means such as Zoom, et cetera. So that's one end. The second end is how do you monitor the spread in schools and that I have to turn over to the experts in public health who may wish to talk and may not wish to talk about whether full random sampling of classrooms is appropriate in order to identify those that have no transmission and those that have an index case that can be contact traced. And that is really in Dr. Holt's domain, not in mine. So poor Dr. Holt has to get that question. <laughs> well, I, before we move to Dr. Holt's response to that, I, and my curiosity is in those families that may not be in college, but they have young children and they need to work and they use or have utilized or depended on their grandparents for daycare or support after school care. How does a grandparent serve in that role when there aren't other options? I don't know the answer to that question. Okay, uh, I, that's I my concern. I, I don't think they can. They have to look at their own. It's a personal choice for them. Understood. Thank you. Um, not be recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, can you hear me okay? I'm actually in my car, yes. so trying to. Okay. Um, <laughs> um, so thank you uh, so much, Dr. Curran. That was um, very, very helpful information, um, information that I am happy to share with the school board and the superintendent and his staff. I think that's um, very, very important information uh, to be considered as we are um, um, grappling with how to reopen schools safely for our students. And um, I'm happy to do that uh, this after this afternoon a little bit. Of course, I don't think I could be as eloquent as you could be doing it. Um, so, uh, but I'll do my best to share that information. And and I and if you haven't been connected to the superintendent, school board members, I'd be happy to make that connection so that um, you can relay some of that information to them. Um, today we are um, meeting at three o'clock to. Um, discuss the reopening of schools and potentially vote on a plan to reopen schools and uh, which includes three options includes the brick and mortar option which about half of our population has indicated they they would prefer that option and over half of our teachers actually have preferred that they would like to return to brick and mortar and the second option being the e-learning option which is the option which was utilized the last nine weeks of school when the, the um, state of Florida closed the schools uh, with, um, with, their, with an executive order. And then the third option is the, the virtual school, which is a separate school um, for students to enroll in virtually to do their work. And so, um, so I want, just wanted to thank you for that information. Uh, I did want to, uh, you know, this is obviously a very, very challenging time for uh, parents and students and teachers and uh, the folks trying to make these decisions because it is quite a, um, a split response that we're receiving from our, uh, our stakeholders. Uh, and um, it doesn't seem like either one is going to be uh, the perfect option, obviously, you know, with uh, Commissioner Overman making or posing the question about grandparents, you know, we are certainly concerned about the vulnerability of the elderly, and we know that two things are going to happen. Whichever path that the school board decides to take today, if if brick and mortar is chosen, uh, some of those some of those grandparents You're breaking up, Ms. Nively. who live with young young children. And, and young individuals 
Okay. Mr. Nabi, you're breaking up. Is that up. better? Any better? Go ahead. Can you hear me? Can you hear me now? Yes, no better. Go okay. ahead. So, um, so, 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 okay, great. Thank you. Uh, some of those grandparents are going to be exposed by um, children who are attending school or teachers who are in the school system and, and could potentially bring, bring back that virus to elderly individuals who are living in their homes. But also what happens if we don't offer brick and mortar is that grandparents, because of child care needs, um, will be taking care uh, and e-learning with their students and, and their, their grandchildren and their um, exposure is also um, increased by that as well because parents who need to work uh, are not going to be able to uh, necessarily stay home and e-learn with their student. They have to uh, earn, a, earn, earn a living for their families and therefore uh, grandparents are uh, a lot of times uh, the ones that families depend on to for care for their students when they are not attending school. So um, my point is to say that, uh, you know, it's a very difficult situation. It doesn't appear that it's going to be, um, you know, good for, for many people, um, but we're going to do our best to deliberate today, the school district will, with the information that we have and watch the information as it continues to come in and, and do our best to listen to the experts and create a safe environment, uh, whichever environment families choose. And so, um, so thank you again for that information. And if there's anything that uh, you would like to relay to the school board directly or to the superintendent directly, Dr. Curran, we are very happy to to listen to you. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Snavis, since you're on the phone, let me ask you a question. I know you all are going to be meeting at three o'clock and. I know you all are taking under consideration of how you're going to open the schools up. You talked about half the teachers and half the, the uh, parents would like to be in the brick and mortar. Um, I, you didn't give a percentage of what the other ones were. Um, and we're always talking about the students, the students, but have, we ta have you all taken into consideration of uh, what happens to those faculty and staff that could be vulnerable uh, because of whatever illnesses they may have? Uh, have you taken into consideration what happens to those folks? Uh, do they come back? Do they take leave do they what do they do have you all taken under consideration yes uh yes sir thank you chair for asking that question uh we have taken a lot of that into consideration obviously we do have teachers who have medical conditions that make them more vulnerable than other teachers we would not want to force uh, a teacher to um, be in a classroom if they have a medical condition that um, makes them you know more vulnerable to the virus if they were to contract it and so uh, we are we are doing our best to consider options for teachers to participate in e-learning and virtual school, uh, those who choose not to be in the classroom, um, and the teachers who do choose to uh, return to school, which there is about 58% of teachers that are willing to return to the classroom, um, and um, obviously putting those teachers uh, back into the brick and mortar um, if they do not, um, have any uh, um, you know um, reservations about about uh, returning to school? So, um, but yes, we've been working with the Classroom Teachers Association. Uh, we've been working with um, t teacher focus groups. We've been working with citizens advisory committees, um, all trying to come up with the best ideas and the best ways to keep teachers safe and to um, and to continue to uh, provide them with uh, compensation whether they're in the classroom or whether they're uh, ET, uh, you know, virtually teaching um, from home. Okay, thank you very much. Commissioner Merman, you recognize. Okay, uh, I see no other hands. So Dr. Curran, thank you very much for your presentation. We truly appreciate it. Thank you. Stay sir. safe. Testing size overview, Mr. Early. Yes, sir. Um, one second here. I'm going to try to put up my presentation real quick. Let's see here. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and members of the Emergency Policy Group. I'm Gene Early, um, Director of Healthcare Services for Hillsborough County. This presentation is a very quick and brief 
presentation that responds to Commissioner Marm's request that I discuss the sustainability of our current test sites and whether there is anything that the EPG can do to further support the testing. The COVID-19 environment is very dynamic and challenging and circumstances do continually change. Currently, we represent, meaning Hillsborough County, approximately 20% of the overall testing being done in Hillsborough County with an estimated 80% or higher being performed by the healthcare systems and other commercial and private testing sites in Hillsborough County. The public testing sites that we're currently operating in coordination with our partners includes Raymond James Stadium, which is basically in coordination with the state uh, Division of Emergency Operations and the County Partnership. Lee Davis and Plant City and South Shore Community Resource Centers utilize state staffing for the next two weeks, and then the county assumes staffing responsibilities. The Sun City and Wanama Transcare and Enterprising Latinos are helping to support and do that site. Town and Country is Tampa Family Health Centers, and Brand, which is a new one, and then Brandon, which is Suncoast Community Healthcare Centers, Inc. So sustainability is really dependent upon available resources and demand. And you've seen this before because I presented it to one of the last ones that I did. Um, it basically depends on the resource availability, which includes our healthcare systems, our county resources, our state and federal resources, and other local resources. The second part of that has to do with staffing, demand, PPE, and test kits, and of late, laboratories' abilities to process it. And then finally, that allows us to do the testing at various sites and uh, to try to meet the community needs. But we have been continuing to do ongoing strategies for testing and sustainability, and we continue to increase healthcare systems testing through increases in our existing test site capacities, through new site integration of testing into our existing healthcare systems, contracts with ambulance contractors or others such as Transcare, and AMR, which basically do a lot of our, um, like YMAMA and also mobilization testing. And we continue to use local partnerships, state staffing assistance, or local staffing models to the extent staffing resources are available. Ongoing monitoring of capabilities, <clears throat> excuse me, demand and available test sites within the community, such as CVS and Walgreens and other community care uh, testing sites expected to increase over time may reduce demand at our existing sites. We've been very fortunate in that the EOC has been incredibly um, helpful in doing support of the public health and they continue use of various approaches to maximize our testing, including elimination of restrictive criteria, mobile testing, uh, targeting vulnerable populations, nursing homes, assisted living, some of our poor populations and Hispanic communities, continuance of the Raymond James Central testing site, the new testing sites at Waimama, Lee Davis, South Shore. And now, now they're increasing some of the testing days and hours of operation, lock up testing with appointments and increased mobilization. We've even utilized some GIS maps to really mm -hmm. mark where all of the access sites are for Hillsborough County. So basically, I think that the um, EPG has been tremendous in their support of these programs and these sites. And I would like to acknowledge all our partners, sustainability and demand is and will continue to be based. The continued support of the Director of Emergency Operations for the State of Florida, the Board of County Commissioners, the Emergency Policy Group, the community and private healthcare systems, the EOC, EMS, and the ambulance providers and others who are working with us in partnership to ensure the community testing needs are and continue to be met. <clears throat> so I would say that it's not a it's not really a expiration of lease leases that um, ensures our continued sustainability. It's all of those partners, and I would like to especially um, acknowledge uh, Mr. Dudley. Um, Commissioner <clears throat> Merman and all of the people on your EPG who um, who continually support the healthcare. And I would also um, say as well that, that Bonnie Wise, 
uh, Chief Jones, all of them have been just tremendous uh, help in making sure that this is sustained and continues. And I'll stop there. Mr. Early, thank you very much for uh, your presentation. Thank you very much for all you do. And you've been on top of this since day one. I really appreciate all the work that you're doing. Uh, Ms. Snively, you recognize for a question. <laughs> Ms. Snively, you're recognized for a question. Probably. Okay. Sorry, I need to take my hand down. Sorry about that. Okay. Commissioner Overman, you're recognized for a question. Thank you. Thank you very much. And um, Dr. Early, thank you very, very, very much for your report. It's very helpful to see the hierarchy of the process for testing. Um, should we should we see um, an increase as as you know we have a two, almost two hundred thousand kids that are going to be going getting back into the education system and uh, maybe if if based on what Ms. Um, Stively indicated if if fifty percent of them go back to school um, if if family transmission seems to be the catalyst for our community spread. Do you have a plan? Should we experience a surge, you know, a month and a half from after schools open? Um, at what what resources can you call on, given the lower tier, to help address that need should it arise? We have a <clears throat> excuse me. Um, we have a, a surge committee based on the four healthcare systems in Hillsborough County. Um, <clears throat> that excuse me that that really they meet regularly i meet with them every friday um and we basically are now getting ready because of some of the things that dr curran and dr holt and others have done um to maybe do a small focus group um within that search group that basically was going to look at and this was suggested by commissioner merman and others i guess um we basically are going to take and kind of monitor the search um, um, performance and see how we're doing with it. Right now, that's not an issue, but we're gonna have Dr. Um, what we're planning on doing is Dr. Curran, uh, Dr. Holt, Dr. Emmanuel, um, Dr. Levine and some others to kind of help us watch that. And then if we need to, we can bring that subgroup back to the full committee uh, for the surge group and uh, discuss it further and take whatever actions we necessarily need. Excellent. Thank you very much. Yes, ma'am. Commissioner Merman, you recognize. Um, no question. Thank you very briefly. Um, I just uh, thank you very much for the information. Um, and I think if we, if the schools do reopen bricks and mortar at some point and there is a surge, how are we going to test all these kids? I mean, you're, are you going to be able to plug them into your testing sites or I guess maybe that would be a question for your subgroup. Maybe you can come back uh, later um, to the EPG with your answer because that's what would concern me. I mean, there's 200,000, 210,000 kids in the school system um, and that would certainly put a lot of pressure on our uh, testing sites. So. I guess I would just ask, can you come up with a plan possibly if that would happen? Yes, ma'am, we can have them look at it and see what they recommend. Okay, thanks. Okay, Mr. Early, thank you very much for your presentation. We appreciate it. Yes, sir. County Attorney Update, Ms. Beck. Yes, good afternoon, Chair Miller and EPG board members. Christine Beck, County Attorney. Um, we have provided another draft order in your backup um, to extend the local state of emergency for another seven days. And Mr. Chair, at this time, it would be appropriate to entertain a motion with regard to that order. So move approval. Second. Motion by Commissioner, motion by Commissioner Murma, second by Commissioner Oman to approve the emergency, uh, the, extension of the, the extension of the local emergency order. Uh, seeing no questions, please call the roll. <clears throat> Miller? Yes. Overman? Yes. Merman? Yes. Chronister? Donald Lazinski, I would step in for Chronister, yes. Thank you. Caster? Yes. Ross? Yes. Has Mr. Lott arrived? 
This is Kilton for law, yes. And Snively. Yes. Motion carried eight to zero. Thank you. Anything further, Ms. Beck? No, sir. Okay. Thank you very much. We now move into discussion. Is there any items to be discussed today? Commissioner Oldman, you recognize. Thank you. Thank you. And at the last meeting, I had asked um, Ms. Snively to provide us with some insight on the experience during the summer programs that, you know, that the school administered and, and any level of exposure or how those were handled. Ms. Snively, are you able to provide that report at this meeting? Um, through the chair, can you hear me okay? Yes, go ahead. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, at this time, I know that no um, post or pre-K programs were, were shut down due to COVID cases during this, this summer. Um, I don't know the exact number of if there were COVID cases uh, reported. Um, I can get that to you by the next meeting. I apologize. I was focused on uh, the operation itself and uh, and got the information uh, passed over to me by our um, uh, our superintendent staff that that no facilities with regard to um, Hillsborough County school programs were shut ever shut down during the summer. Thank you very much. Ms. Davis, did I see your hand up? Uh, yes, thank you, Chair. I just wanted to um, quickly answer a question that, that you um, sort of posed a little earlier. I just wanted to give you some data and then remind every everyone of one one quick thing. But um, as of today, uh, we you know we sent out a uh, declaration of intent survey to our parents and te and teachers as well. And the information that I have as of today, as far as the, the students who choose. Um, each of the three options, the percentages are as follows. Students would um, uh, choose brick and mortar. 49% uh, of our parents chose to send their students back to a traditional classroom. Um, for e-learning, it was 42%. And for virtual learning, it was 9%. And then teachers chose 58% uh, chose brick and mortar, 37% chose e-learning, and 4% chose virtual school. And so just to uh, follow up on that, I know there's been a lot of um, kind of um, infer inference that 212 children will be going back to school, uh, but we know that only about half, if if uh, brick and mortar uh, continues to be an option for our, our schools, a choice for our parents, that only about half of the students would actually be returning to the classroom and only about a little over half of teachers may be returning to the classroom. So, so yes, we do have over 210,000 students total, but only half of those would be, be actually returning to the classroom. So thank you very much for allowing me to share that. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, is there any other discussion from anyone today? Any other items to discuss today? Seeing none, uh, we will again have our APG meeting on Monday, July 27th at 1.30. And seeing no further business today, everyone have a good weekend and we're adjourned. Have a good weekend. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.